Now let's look at the uh, pancreas. The pancreas is a dual function organ in the sense that it has both exocrine uh, and endocrine components. Exocrine meaning that the products of an exocrine gland are secreted to a surface that communicates with the exterior, whereas endocrine means that the products of the gland is secreted uh, to a surface on the interior, namely uh, into the blood. So here's a uh, section of pancreas uh, which we can see here. The first thing you may notice is that the section appears to be fractured or broken up into um, parts or lobules and in fact there uh, would be connective tissue in here and this tends to separate during the course of uh, tissue preparation. So the pancreas is in fact divided up into lobules. The second thing which should be fairly evident as you look at it are these large structures surrounded by pink staining uh, connective tissue and these are either vascular structures which are supplying uh, blood to and draining blood from the pancreas or in fact as we see uh, definitely here and here and here these are uh, large pancreatic ducts which drain pancreatic secretions into the duodenum and finally if you're sharp-eyed or if you've looked at the slide before you may notice uh, small uh, areas where the cells appear to stain a little bit um, less intensely than they do elsewhere in the surrounding uh, pancreas and these are probably and we'll be able to confirm this on higher magnification uh, islets of uh, Langerhans at this low magnification is a good opportunity to point out that the ducts which drain the pancreas uh, are classified as two different types. There are interlobular or ducts between lobules such as this one here and this one here and uh, this one here and this one here and uh, here. So these are ducts which are found on the connective tissue that separates lobules and then there are intralobular ducts which we'll see when we increase in magnification somewhat. Now at slightly higher magnification we can make out uh, some more details of the uh, pancreas here. On this side here, here is one uh, lobule of pancreas, here's another lobule of pancreas, here's another lobule of pancreas here, and here's another lobule of uh, pancreas here. In the uh, interlobular connective tissue in this region we have a large uh, artery um, here, so this would be one of the branches of the uh, pancreatic artery supplying blood. And here we've got some nerve also because the uh, pancreas is uh, quite well innervated. Um, here we have one of these uh, islets of Langerhans and perhaps we'll look at this in a little more detail in a moment. The remaining um, cellular tissue which we can see in the background here is largely composed of secretory acini or clusters of uh, pancreatic acinar cells which are secreting pancreatic juice containing pancreatic enzymes or pancreatic zymogens. In places uh, we can see uh, small ducts, there's one for example um, here, uh, a very good example of one just here, and a good example of one here, and these are ducts which are found within a lobule, so these are intra-lobular uh, ducts, here's another and here's another, and these carry the pancreatic secretions to the larger inter-lobular ducts. Here at a little higher magnification we can look at a, a islet of Langerhans. Uh, this is the pale staining uh, region which we can see here. Uh, you can get the sense or a hint that there might be some very delicate uh, connective tissue that sort of separates this um, region of the islet from the surrounding um, pancreatic uh, exocrine uh, tissue which we see here. Um, it's not really possible to make out um, in plain staining such as this H&E stain specimen the differences between the different types of uh, cells of the islets of Langerhans but broadly for example uh, cells that secrete glucagon tend to be uh, located toward the outside of the islet forming around the rim here whereas insulin secreting cells for example tend to be in toward the center of the islet. It's not really possible to make out uh, much more detail than that at this magnification. Here in this uh, little fold of connective tissue here we see a little arteriole and this will be supplying a capillary bed which um, both um, supplies blood to the surrounding exocrine pancreas but also in the region of this islet of Langerhans because islets have a pretty rich uh, blood supply. Also as we look around here we can find in some connective tissue that separates the lobules so this would be an interlobular duct and here's a smaller interlobular duct that would converge to join this one. We can see that in the larger interlobular ducts the epithelium is very very tall columnar. In fact it may uh, appear pseudostratified or indeed uh, stratified whereas in the smaller ducts what we have is a simple uh, columnar epithelium as we can see um, here. In 
parts, we may see very small dots such as this one here, and we look at this perhaps in a little uh, higher uh, magnification. And this, as we can see it here, is an intralobular duct. It's embedded in the surrounding uh, excrement pancreas, the pancreatic ACE in our cells. We can see it has a simple low cuboidal uh, epithelium, pretty distinct looking lumen. And then surrounding it here, these are the uh, pancreatic uh, ACE in our cells. Uh, we can see that they have generally a kind of a red eosinophilic staining cytoplasm. And this is due to the uh, amount of um, endoplasmic reticulum they contain because they secrete large amounts of protein in the form of pancreatic zymogens or enzymes. You will read in the textbooks about a cell type called um, centro acinar cells that form the initial part of some of these pancreatic uh, acini and they really uh, are not something that you need to worry about too much. Here's a, 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 a centro acinar cell here, this is a centro uh, acinar cell here. They're distinguished um, as the initial duct uh, cells that converge eventually on the intralobular ducts and they form the initial part of a secretory acinus where the duct forms so here and here are these two central acinar cells and other than that the distinction about them is not terribly important. Here's a piece of parotid salivary gland and at first glance you would be forgiven uh, for thinking that it looks essentially identical to the pancreas. In fact embryologically the pancreas and the salivary glands are closely related uh, to one another. Uh, on this particular piece of uh, salivary gland, this is the parotid uh, salivary gland, uh, we can see that it too is divided into lobules with connective tissue septae extending between the lobules. Uh, within these connective tissue septae between the lobules are the interlobular connective tissue. We can see some structures which are either vascular structures or ducts. These may in fact be salivary gland ducts or large uh, arteries and venules um, carrying blood too. And, uh, um, taking blood away from the uh, salivary gland. And we can see paler staining material that appears to be um, part of the salivary gland. These of course aren't islets of Langerhans which are diagnostic for and unique to the pancreas but in fact are uh, in intralobular uh, ducts which are found within the lobules. There's a very large uh, piece of lymphoid tissue here, effectively a lymph node, uh, which is found uh, here associated with this particular piece of parotid, but it's not necessarily a feature of all parotid uh, sections. If we go up in magnification, and move away from where the lymph node uh, is. So here we see a, uh, a lobule of the uh, parotid um, salivary gland and within this lobule we see quite a large number of uh, intralobular uh, ducts and these are lined by a simple cuboidal to perhaps uh, simple columnar epithelium as they uh, get larger. We can see that there's relatively homogeneous eosinophilic staining with small dense dark stained uh, nuclei and this forms the bulk of the uh, structure of the um, salivary gland. If we go to the uh, highest magnification we can actually take a look perhaps at the uh, organization of the secretory acini and again the emphasis here is we're comparing it at least mentally with the appearance of the uh, pancreas. So really the first thing to notice is that um, the cells form a sini and the center part of the acinus uh, or the lumen of the acinus is not really apparent most of the time. There's a little bit of acinus lumen here but you don't see it very often. Uh, the acini themselves are clusters of cells. The nuclei of the uh, parotid gland secretory cells tend to be clustered around the base of, uh, of each acinus like this and they're distinctly uh, dark and um, heterochromatic staining as opposed to the slightly more uh, euchromatic, less dark nuclei that one would find in the um, uh, pancreas. And we can see that in the background here there are no um, islets of Langerhans uh, visible. We do see these ducts here and these are within a lobule so these are intralobular um, salivary gland ducts. So for example here's a very good example of a simple cuboidal and another branch of the same uh, simple cuboidal here. One thing to note about the parotid uh, salivary gland is that all of the secretory acini and the exocrine component, so there are many acini here, there's perhaps one here, there's one here, one here, 
one here. All of these acini, the cells which make up these acini, are effectively identical uh, to one another. And because uh, these are all eosinophilic staining and stain relatively homogeneously, these are said to be serous appearing. So these are all serous acini. And one of the diagnostics for the parotid salivary gland is that it is made up entirely of serous secretory acini with no other types present. By contrast with the parotid salivary gland, we're going to take a quick look at a submandibular salivary gland, a second type of um, salivary gland. This one is distinguished from the parotid salivary gland by virtue of the fact that it not only secretes a uh, protein-rich serous fluid, but also mixed with it is a uh, mucus secretion as well. So the secretory acini in this gland will have both uh, serous and mucus uh, components to them, so it's a mixed uh, gland. On the outside of the gland here, we can see a capsule, pretty dense connective tissue uh, capsule. Here's the structure of the gland itself. And again, we can see from these little uh, tear marks here that it's split into lobules with some connective tissue in these little uh, regions between the uh, lobules. We'll go straight to higher magnification to take a look at the general arrangement of the uh, submandibular gland. And here at higher magnification, we can see first uh, intralobular ducts. And we look at these ducts in a bit more detail in uh, just a moment. These are intralobular because they're within a single lobule. Here's some connective tissue separating this lobule from this lobule, and a tear here where there was connective tissue that would have separated uh, this lobule from this lobule. And what you might be able to see here is that in and amongst the dark uh, purple staining material, which are the secretory uh, serous acini of this gland, there are these very much paler staining, mauve staining, foamier uh, looking areas, and these are mucus acini. And we're going to take a look at these now in a little more detail at even higher magnification. So here we're looking at the secretory acini of the submandibular uh, salivary gland. Uh, up here we have a small intralobular duct. So the secretions from many of these secretory acinis will drain eventually into this uh, intralobular duct. And really what we can see here is that there are in fact uh, two types of uh, secretory acini based on their histological appearance. One type such as this type we can see here, the cells are very very pale staining. Uh, they converge toward a central lumen, which isn't visible, but would be in this region here. And the nuclei are confined to the bases of the cells. And these are so-called mucus acini, uh, secreting a mucusy uh, type of saliva. Here's another mucus acinus here. Here's a more complex pair of mucus acini here and here. Elsewhere, the acini are so-called serous uh, acini. So they stain with the eosin component of hematoxylin and eosin. And so th here, it's not really possible to make out uh, individual uh, acini, and it certainly isn't possible to see the lumens uh, of the acini, but eventually these lumens all converge on these structures, the intralobular ducts. There's quite a large number of ducts visible in the submandibular salivary gland because the ducts in the submandibular sal salivary gland are particularly long. So we see lots of them cut in cross-sectional profile uh, when we look at a section such as this. One thing which I didn't mention regarding the parotid gland, but is true for both the parotid and the submandibular gland, is some of these ducts form part of a system of what are called striated ducts. Now it's not really apparent at this magnification, but would be if we could go to 40x, which we can't. But the basal aspect of these cells is um, somewhat stripy appearing or striated. And this is because they have many, many mitochondria lined up in some basal infoldings of the uh, cell membrane. And this is a characteristic of ion uh, transporting or ion secreting cells and this is because striated ducts are responsible for modulating the ionic concentration of the saliva which is being secreted.